So we are the leading platform globally for social video advertising. And by social video advertising, what we mean is the grown-up version of viral, okay? So where viral denotes random, unpredictable, unmeasurable, social video denotes predictable, measurable, repeatable. So what we're trying to do here is help brands make more socially optimized content of any length, generally a minute and a minute and a half. It's essentially content marketing, but socially optimized content marketing. Um, we're a London-based company, um, and now we're up at 13 offices worldwide. We're about to hard launch in Asia um, three weeks today. Um, and we work with some of the world's biggest advertisers in terms of their social content marketing. So when you see the Old Spice guy, uh, viral success, when you see the Dove Real Beauty Sketches campaign, it's no coincidence that all of those campaigns were hugely successful because we were floating around somewhere in the background helping those brands make more socially optimized content and help them distribute it in a much more effective way. Um, our main piece of technology is this thing on the right here called the viral video chart. Um, the viral video chart is the world's biggest social content sharing database. It's got over 450 billion streams worth of data in it since 2006. So any video that's ever been uploaded onto the public web, our database has a record of who shared it, what platform they've shared it on, and if they've got a public profile, what they've said about it. So if you ever see Campaign Media Asia, or you see the press or Mashable talking about social and viral data and sharing data, they're using our data. So we distribute and syndicate this data to over 50 publications globally. Um, so there's been an explosive growth in branded content sharing, and it's not just cats on skateboards uh, and dogs on skateboards and lots of animals on skateboards. People are sharing branded content. So if you look at the top three most shared videos in 2006, which is right at the bottom there, those top three most shared pieces of branded content were shared 1.4 million times in 2006. The top three most shared videos in 2006 13 were shared 12.2 million times. So it's a 50x increase in the amount of sharing that's happening around branded content. And if you're a brand and you can make content that will resonate with consumers, instead of subjugating them through forcing them to watch TV advertising, you can actually get them to voluntarily engage and watch your content and then go on and share it. And has anyone seen the Nielsen study that came out um, that showed the trust in advertising of different platforms between 2009 and 2012. Okay, so what it did, it looked at TV, it looked at press, it looked at all the different platforms, and the only platform in terms of trust, consumer trust that went up between 2009 and 2012 was word of mouth. So word of mouth went up from 90% trust to 92% trust. TV was down below 50% for the first time, press was down below 50% for the first time, so if you can create socially optimized content that consumers will share and talk about, you're creating electronic word of mouth. And in Path to Purchase, it's one of the most influential parts of the, uh, of the decision-making process in consumers. Why do video shares matter? So video shares matter because um, we've, we've been analyzing uh, a lot of post-campaign viewing behavior. And somebody who's watched a video after it's been shared to them by a peer 33% of those people within three days would go on and talk to someone about that brand and that video in real life. 24% of the people who watched it will go to the homepage of the brand. 18% of people will search for it, and 9% of people said that they'd go on and purchase it. So the idea of peer-to-peer -peer endorsement that comes with the video is really, really, really powerful uh, and drives brand metrics across the board. And McKinsey uh, stated that a high-impact recommendation from a friend is 50 times more likely to trigger a purchase. So this is the power of electronic word of mouth. Um, what's interesting is if you start to analyze different markets, so we're, the, the, the theme of today's subject is obviously the geography of sharing, and uh, unruly have been analyzing sharing video sharing data across the globe to look for differences in different populations to be able to help regional and local and pan-regional advertisers start to understand what kinds of content to make and how to get them to market. And if you can see here that Malaysians are, the, the average share rate of a piece of video um, on, in Malaysians and across the rest of Asia, um, Asians are twice as likely to share video ads than their Western counterparts. So um, the, the act of sharing content in Asia 
peer-to-peer -peer, peer -peer sharing is, is actually commonplace. So if you can make great content and distribute it here in Asia, you've got much more likely that people are going to share it. By the way, share rate is defined as the number of views that it takes to generate a share. So if you have a 10% share rate, what that means is that for every 10 views you buy, one person will go on and share it. And the reason that's important is because one video share often creates three organic views. So on, on, on average, if you can get 10% people of people watching your video sharing it, you'll be getting 30% earned media. So why do people share? And this is the thing that fascinates Unruly and keeps us awake at night because it's the most intellectually stimulating part of what we do, um, is the formula of sharing, the DNA of social content. And believe it or not, there is actually a DNA. It's not just myth, there is a science behind it. And Unruly's mission is to help brands understand the science behind sharing and make more socially optimized content. So advertising, on one hand you have art over here, and on the other hand you have science over here. And I think, and we think, there's just a bit too much art and not quite enough science. So we're trying to help bring scientific rigor to the content creation process because the, every brand that we see is about to embark on content marketing in a big way. But they have the same six questions. What kind of content should I be making for different platforms? How does it fit alongside my TV strategy? How does audiovisual deliver across all the different platforms? How do I measure it? How do I make it repeatable? How do I work with my agencies in making it? And how much does it cost me? Whether it's retail, FMCG, automotive, same six questions from all brands. We're here to help you answer all of those questions using data and science. We're not interested in opinion. We're interested in objective, consumer-driven insight. So this lady, has anyone heard of this lady? She's called Dr. Karen Nelson Field. She's the leading global academic looking at the psychology of human sharing. She's released numerous white papers. The Ehrenberg Bass Institute are actually funded by brands. They're a, uh, they're a South Australia uh, academic institute. And we think that those guys, alongside Harvard, Wharton University of Pennsylvania, and Cass Business School in London, are the four leading global academic institutes. And we've been working with all of them to create the formula for social success. Karen released a book um, back in September called uh, viral marketing, the science of sharing, and I'm just going to share with you now seven of her findings. So this isn't Unruly's opinion, this is coming from academia. She's paying me for this, by the way. So, number one, make the content emotional. It's kind of common sense, but content that elicits a strong emotional response is twice as likely to be shared as content that doesn't elicit an emotional response. So make your audience feel something and they will share. Two, be positive. So videos which provoke a strong positive response are 30% more likely than those which provoke a strong negative emotion. So on this slide here, we've got 18 different emotions. These are the emotions that Unruly test for when we do our content pre-testing. You can see here there are positive emotions. There are also some negative emotions. Generally, for brands, negative emotions are out because you don't want to make someone feel angry because they're not going to go and buy more tissue if you make them feel angry. Um, so what you need to do is pick. So we think that every brand should understand its own brand palette of emotions. By that, we mean a painter will have a palette of paints that they use when they're painting a picture. Every brand should have three or four emotions that they can be genuine with, because if you're not authentic in social, people will flame you, um, and also that deliver brand, uh, brand value. And when you start to analyze as many videos as Unruly has, you start to see patterns emerging in terms of the different emotions that different categories use. So we can tell you all of the emotions that automotive advertisers use. We can tell you all of the emotions that consumer tech advertisers use. So if you mapped the emotions onto a wheel and looked at automotive advertising, you'd see that they cluster around exhilarating, sexy, and cool. Um, whether the creative agencies know it or not, whether the advertiser knows it or not, it's a, it's a kind of similar formula. Consumer tech tends to cluster around uh, knowledge or inspiration and exhilaration. So if you start to be able to map every, all of your competitors on a wheel, you start to pick an emotion and go, well, no one else is using this one. We can use this and be genuine and deliver brand value. Guess what? You've got social content, you've got word of mouth, and you've got uh, all of the kind of uh, hitting all of the purchase funnel that creates for you. So this is what Unruly will, will do. We'll help test your content and be able to understand the emotions that are resonating for your target audience. 
Um, I'm going backwards. Okay, so what we've been able to do, because we've tested so many videos, is we've started to be able to map how different populations respond well to different emotional stimuli. So for example, feelings matter more to Brits than they do to, to other populations. Positivity matters most to Americans and least to Brazilians. And Brazilians share videos the most, followed by people in Southeast Asia. So the unruly share rank algorithm that we've created is, a, is, is available in the US, Brazil. We've just launched it for Southeast Asia today. Um, and we've got it for UK and Germany. So we can test content against all of these populations and we're rolling out this product constantly to be able to tell you exactly how your content, uh, how your target audience will respond to different levels of content. When you start to map those emotions or those psychological responses to different territories, you start to see some interesting stuff. So for example, in the US and the UK, the top three most shared emotions that audiences respond well to are hilarity, happiness and warmth. And in the US, it's hilarity, happiness, followed by surprise. So in the Western world, in, in, the, in, in the US and in the UK and New Zealand and Australia, hilarity is the most shared trigger. Go to Brazil, test content in Brazil, exhilaration is the most shared trigger. So people tend to be stimulated by content that makes them feel exhilarated. So again, you can start to map not only different categories to different emotions, you can start to map different audiences and populations to the kinds of emotions they respond well to. So Southeast Asia is totally different. For Southeast Asia, it's inspiration, happiness, and, exhilar and, and exhilaration. So if you're an advertiser and you can understand that the content that's going to be shared or the, 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 the content formula for, for Southeast Asia is making content that makes people feel inspired or happy or exhilarated, it helps you along that path and it helps takes a lot of the guesswork out of the content you're creating. Social motivation is another huge reason why people share content. So where the emotion is almost the subconscious reason to share, social motivation is the conscious reason why you would share a piece of content. So there's no point just having a funny 30 second TV ad if there's no real reason or call to action to make you want to pass it along. So if you look at the different social motivations, you start to see patterns in these as well. So for example, in the US, people will share content more to get a reaction. That's why they'll share it on Facebook. That's why they'll share it on Twitter. Same in the UK. Um, go to Southeast Asia. The main reason people will share content in Southeast Asia is because they want to seek someone else's opinion. They won't just put it up there to say, look at me, look at me, look at me. They'll put it up there and say, hey, guys, what do you think? I want to get something back from you. So it's quite interesting, these patterns. And social utility and social good Southeast Asia is the only territory where social good, in terms of a, a motivation to share content, comes out in the top three. So this is why I think we see a lot of content made here in Southeast Asia that has that kind of corporate social responsibility feel to it, because people will share it. So everyone probably saw the Life Boy Gondapa Help a Child Reach Five campaign. That had social good at its heart and therefore was really, really shared. So. You can start to be able to understand these patterns amongst consumers and their behavior. You can shortcut the whole process and accelerate your content marketing programs using this framework. Not only do people share content for different reasons, but the way they share it is very different. So in sharing, there are two different means of sharing. There's narrow cast sharing, which is just sharing via email and very narrow one-to-one. -one. And then there's broadcast sharing, which is broadcasting along uh, on Facebook, or on Twitter, which is you know to everyone. And if you look at the way it, the way people share, it's very different. So, for example, in the U.S. and the, uh, the U.K., people will tend to share content more to a closed list of family before they'll put it out to everybody. Um, whereas, if you go to Brazil and you go to Southeast Asia, people are less discriminative. They will just share with everybody. Um, and I think this just talks to a, a bit more of the guarded nature, potentially, of, of Brits and Americans um, in terms of the way they share content. So again, when you're thinking about how to distribute your content, and you know this, you can, you can start to build up a real good picture of exactly how to take your content to market. So that's just a brief bit about the geography of sharing. And I just gave you a real top line uh, overview on that. Um, but the third thing that, that Karen said in her book is forget cute cats and celebrities, focus, focus on personal triumph. 
So in all of the research that she looked at, um, there was no creative device, by creative device I mean celebrity, cat, dog, something like that, that was shared more than any other creative device. So we all kind of get drilled into us when we talk to people about this great new video. Have you seen it? It's got a baby in it, right? So everyone just goes, yeah, awesome. I'm just going to put a baby or a celebrity in my content and everybody's going to share it. But the problem that we have is that we only ever get shown the successes. Whenever you see someone going, you've seen this video, they only show you the one that works. They don't show you the 30 of them that didn't, okay? So across Karen's research, there are more failures that have cats, dogs, and celebrities in them than there are successes. And there's no creative device that drives sharing more than any other thing apart from personal triumph, the story of the underdog. If you can create content that tells a story of somebody overcoming a personal affliction or a situation, it is the most shared creative device. It, it stands out uh, against everything else. The irony is only 3% of all the 10,000 videos that we tested to build our norms used personal triumph. So we're giving you a, a few of the keys to the car here. Make videos of personal triumph in them, and you'll get people sharing and talking about your brand. Um, and here's an example of one. I'm not going to play the video because we're short on time, but it's a, it's a great example from P&G um, showing a, uh, a deaf and mute uh, musician overcoming her, her, overcoming her issues and becoming a, a concerto violinist. Uh, and he, as you can see here, over almost half a million shares, which is a brilliant performance. Be proud of your brand. One of the biggest myths in content marketing is that if you put loads of branding in your content, nobody will share it. And we've been, again, we've had it drilled into us by people who are basing this on gut feel that, oh, in social content, don't put any branding in, save the branding until the end, and then people will share and talk about it. There's zero correlation between branding and sharing. In fact, Karen found, and her research found, that actually the campaigns that work best had more branding in them and were more overtly branded. Um, so one of the issues that advertisers have is that if you make great content and everyone wants to share it but no one knows who your brand is, you're not getting any brand value. So there's an example in these four of uh, a global FMCG brand who made one of the standout pieces of content for the London Olympics. Um, they didn't do the brand reveal until 1 minute 30 into the video. And when you do eye tracking, you analyze people's emotions at different points in the video, the main emotion that people felt at that point was confusion. They didn't get the connection between this video they'd seen and then suddenly a list of brands scrolling through. They didn't understand. So that video, when you do brand recall on it, only had 10% brand recall for that advertiser. So on one hand, the advertiser's done the hard bit. They've made content that everybody wants to share and enjoy but they've done themselves a disservice because they've only created 10% brand recall. And even worse than that, they had 20% misattribution. So somebody, 20% of the people who watched it misattributed that campaign to somebody else. So they've done a job for another advertiser, not themselves. So there's no correlation between branding and sharing. Um, I'll skip through this one, but her research says that content is not king. Content's actually queen. So. The, the, the means of distribution and taking content to market has a much bigger impact on the shareability of content than the content itself. So because, of, because we're humans, um, if you see a piece of video that it seems is really important that everybody's sharing it, you know, you might have looked at Gangnam Style and just gone, well, I don't really like that guy dancing like he's a horse. Um, but you probably shared it anyway because everyone else was sharing it. So that's the idea. You know, if content is ubiquitous and it feels important, people will share it. So actually, means to market and distribution is more important than the content itself. And if you just get your content and you've got amazing content and you just put it on YouTube and hope everyone will come and see it, you're going to be let down um, because there's a 0.001% chance a user will see your content organically if you just put it up on YouTube. I mean, that is, that's a, a low, right? Um, I'm not even going to go through this one. Yeah, um, exhilaration. Exhilaration as a trigger um, has the highest brand recall of any trigger. So not only can you map emotions to how shareable they are, but you can also start mapping different emotions to different levels of brand recall. So for example, exhilaration is the most recalled trigger um, with 65% brand recall. So if you make content that makes people feel exhilarated, they're 65% 
Uh, the brand recall on that is 65%, and hilarity is the second most with 51%. So imagine not only being able to have a hierarchy of all the emotions that, as a brand, you can be genuine with, but being able to say the brand favorability or the brand recall that you can get from each of those triggers starts to become really, really interesting. Um, and this would be a video with a guy driving around. Um, it's a bit of a prankvert, but again, Pepsi have done this really, really well. Um, on this Pepsi Max campaign, has anyone seen this Pepsi Max campaign? The guy, it's a, it's a prank. Anyway, it's got a lot of views and a lot of shares. Um, Pepsi is completely prevalent throughout that campaign. The camera, the, 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 the hidden camera they shoot the guy with is actually in a can of Pepsi on the dashboard right at the very start of the video. So that's Pepsi saying, it's us, we're, mate, we're, we're going on this journey together and getting a load of brand, brand value off the back of it and people still sharing it. Yeah, go through that. Uh, this is some research that the Ehrenberg Bass did with Mars. Shows that talk, just, just trying to grow uh, communities on Facebook and market to those communities is talking to people who are already heavy buyers. That doesn't grow market share. Um, we're going to get to the fun bit. Right, OK. So if you look on your chair in front of you, has everyone got a pen? We're not giving out pens, by the way. So if you, uh, if you haven't got one, you'll have to kind of beg, borrow, or steal. But if everyone's got a pen, you should have a scorecard on your chair. So on the flip side of the Willett chair, there should be a scorecard. Yep, 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 yep. So I'm going to show you a video. And what I'd like you to do is if you feel an emotion while you're watching this video, score the emotion that you feel and how, how much out of 10 you're feeling it, right? That's the idea. So I'm not giving you a lot of time. Everyone ready? Hello, it's a brand new day. It's a brand new start. Things will go your way. Live a new beginning. For you, we'll go on singing. Today. Okay, so if you felt an emotion then, you know, if you felt warmth or something like that, or contempt, depending on where, how cynical you are, um, then just mark it on the, uh, just mark it down out of 10, um, and then we're going to analyze that against what the actual consumers felt about it. So this is the reveal. So what this does is this is how we begin to look at the, uh, the, the emotions that people felt. So how far up that graph or that line, the, the bubble is, is how intensely the audience felt it. And how big the circle is, is how many of the proportion of the panel felt that. So the idea is you get a big circle at the top, they felt something strongly, and a lot of them felt it. So you can see here that on the McDonald's one, which is the, far, on the, the line on the left, we can see that people felt exhilaration. The most of the panel felt exhilaration on that video, which I don't get, because um, I didn't feel exhilarated. But then again, I'm not the target audience. Um, the, 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 the most intense um, emotion that people felt was inspiration. Did anyone feel inspired? Slightly inspired? My god, you cynical hacks. <laughs> this is an outrage. McDonald's again. Is there anyone from McDonald's in the room? Okay, it's a good job. Um, and, and then happiness. So the three, the, the clustering or the three component emotions that people felt in combination there were happiness, exhilaration, and inspiration. Um, my time's up apparently according to my uh, phone. Um, and then if we look at the social motivation, uh, by the way, this is the norms. So the line on the right the, is the Southeast Asia market norm. So you can see this perform, much performed that market norm in terms of the psychological response that consumers felt. If we look at the social motivations, so the reasons to share that content, for McDonald's, uh, the main, main reason that people would share that is the pink, which is social utility. So people would share it because they, they felt that it was kind of it was social good, it was social utility. 
Um, and, and you can see that against the norms, it actually came in about on average for the norms. Um, so you can start to be able to understand and analyze these videos and start to be able to see the different emotions and how strongly people felt it. Um, that's it. I'm out of time. I've got someone with a yeah. sign up saying time out. Um, but if you want to find out more, we've got our social video lab in a boardroom upstairs um, with all of this kind of like data and stuff in there. So uh, if we've got a couple of appointment slots left, I think, Eddie. So if anyone wants to come along and get more, then speak to myself or my lovely PA secretary, uh, Eddie, over there. Um, and we'll go from there.